or new to meet that God maybe laid on your heart to talk to them or whatever. But we love that. We love that time where people just get to converse, say hi. Um, for some of you, if you're introverts, you're like beeline to the coffee and that's okay too, you know. Um, but we're excited uh, to jump in this series, Living Life in the Spirit. And I'm pumped because I get to speak on Acts 3-4. And uh, get to really jump in, and we want to look at, you know, what Jesus has for us today. And as I was beginning the process of thinking through how to really start this time, I had this moment. You ever had these, like, snapshots in your mind? Remember the old cameras? Now they're digital, but, you know, the old ones are coming back in style. They're hip again. But, right, you, you would take a picture. You don't know what it's going to be until you develop the film. Remember this? And then you would see it, and you're like, oh, that's a pretty good shot. Like, I got a good picture. Or you didn't. But there's moments that are burned into our minds. There's snapshots in life that are burned into our minds. Some of them are amazing. Some of them are difficult and hard. And those are all the things that make us who we are. But there's snapshots. And, and I have a snapshot in my mind that's burned into my heart as we start talking about the Holy Spirit today. And it's from 2006 when um, we adopted our oldest child, she's now 26, we adopted her from Rwanda, Africa. That's part of our journey, my wife and I. We adopted Josiane when she was nine years old, and in the process of trying to get her home, we were stuck in country in over there for over seven weeks. It's a crazy story for a different time. But the snapshot that I have in my mind when we talk about the Holy Spirit is in 2006, we were in Rwanda, we got all the paperwork we needed to leave Rwanda to go to Nairobi, Kenya, to work with the U.S. Um, embassy there to get some final papers. And while we were there, I would go out every day with my dad, and I would go try to do the work that we needed to do to get all the paperwork done. And back at the hotel that we were staying in downtown Nairobi, they had a pool. Well, if you grew up on the, in, in the villages in Rwanda, you don't grow up learning how to swim. Like, that's not something that you grew up doing. And so... Uh, Josiane, who was nine, we had a little swimsuit for her, and she began to want to get in the pool. And so my mom and myself, at different moments, we would teach Josiane how to swim. Now, if you don't know how to swim, then you're still maybe terrified of water, and there's people are that are terrified of water. But if you can go back to the moment where you began to learn how to swim, the pool was terrifying. There's parts of the pool that you're like, that's the deep end, that's the scary end, that's where all the sharks live, Right? And the, the, the shallow part where I can wade in is okay. But the, the snapshot I have in my mind is of Josiane holding tight onto me or other moments to, onto my mom. And we would begin to go out in the depths of the water. And it was fun because they had a hold of us. But yet I remember when Josiane began to venture off of me and off of my mom and begin to learn how to swim in that short week we're there and begin to push off of us and swim, swim, swim to the wall. And the joy and the excitement that she had in her as she began to understand that, yeah, we have to learn how to swim in the pool, but that there's something that amazing happens when we're released to go to the depths. That a pool no longer is a scary thing. The depths of the water aren't a scary thing, but actually can be a lot of fun and can have an exciting moment to us. You guys know what I'm talking about? When we talk about the Spirit of God, last week, Mike, if you didn't listen to last week, man, go listen to it. Mike, it was fire. Mike spoke so well about Pentecost, the Holy Spirit coming. But he had this moment where he talked about from Ezekiel where the river of God began as a trickle. And it got deeper and deeper and deeper. And I really believe for Grace Chapel, we are beginning to understand what does it mean to actually go into the depths of the Holy Spirit. That it's not a scary thing. That actually it's a beautiful place to have fun, to, ex to experience all that God has for us. But it has, I had that snapshot in my mind of what that was like for my daughter to experience the joy that can come in a pool once she realized that the pool was not scary, but this pool was an adventure. And so that's what we're talking about, the Holy Spirit. We're in Acts 3 and 4 today. And to understand Luke uh, Luke's uh, Acts, who wrote it, we also need to understand that Luke and Acts are one book with two volumes. Maybe you didn't know that, but Luke wrote Luke, the, the Gospel of Luke, and Acts. And actually, both of them are supposed to be read together. Uh, in our Bibles, our English Bibles, they've been split apart, basically due to chronologically keeping the Gospels together. But those are supposed to be read together. So to 
understand Luke's thought, you really want to read, starting in Luke, and make your way all the way through Luke and start Acts and just read those together. But the interesting thing about Luke is he also wants you to know the Hebrew Scriptures. He wants you to know the Old Testament that we call it, the Hebrew Scriptures, because to understand Luke, you have to understand the Old Testament Scriptures, and to understand Acts, you need to understand Luke. Does that make sense? So this is how it's kind of been played out for us. So you got to understand that Luke's idea is that the culmination of the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures, is in the person and work of Jesus Christ. The culmination. So that's what he lays out in Luke. And we see Jesus' life. He became the once for all sacrifice on the cross, literally bodily raised back from the dead in the resurrection. And then this idea of acts begins. So Luke has a lot to say about the spirit. Luke sees Jesus as a man filled with the spirit, that, that Jesus modeled what it means to have life in the spirit. I mean, it's so important to Luke that there's all these moments in Luke Acts where he has these very um, big shifts in Jesus' life and in um, Acts where the Holy Spirit is very key on all the different shifts. So the Luke sees that the Spirit of God played out in the life of Jesus and the early church, the apostles, and all that is so important, and we see that. So, so Acts, this idea of this book of Acts, covers what Jesus continued to do and teach. In Acts 1.1, it says this. In my former book, being Luke, okay, so this is Luke writing. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach. So that was the whole point of Luke. The book of Luke, what Jesus began to do and to teach. And what we see in Acts is that there is a beginning and yet it continues. Now Jesus is ascended, he's at the right hand of the Father, and now the Spirit of God has been poured out. Chapter 2, people have received the Holy Spirit. There's this moment where they're speaking in other tongues. The message of Jesus is declared to all these different people. And thousands of people say, I'm going to follow this Jesus. I'm going to follow this Jesus. And so what we see in the book of Acts is the continuation of what Jesus began to do and to teach just now, empowered by the Holy Spirit, the life of Jesus in the apostles and the early followers of Jesus. Acts 9, you'll, we'll get to this in a, in, in, a, in a while, in a few weeks, but Acts 9, they talk about these people being a people of the way. They weren't called Christians. They were called the people of the way, the way of Jesus. They begin to see in the early church that they lived like Jesus, that they talked like Jesus, that they, they, they went after to declare the goodness of the kingdom like Jesus, and so they called them the way. The last thing I want to say, and Mike said this last week too, is don't forget that the main character of the book of Acts is not Peter, it's not Paul, it's not anybody else. The main character of the book of Acts is the life of Christ, is Jesus Christ through the power of the Spirit. That is the main character of the book of Acts. And so that's where we find ourselves. And today, really what I want to do is I want to let the Scriptures speak. I want to to let the Scriptures speak that as we look at the text of Acts 3 and 4, that there's going to be some things that raise to the surface about, about this snapshot. This is the first snapshot after the Spirit of God has been poured out, people speak in tongues, then there's this great message given, and people come to know the way of Jesus, and they say they begin to follow the way of Jesus. This is the first snapshot after that moment. And I think it is so important as we see the book of Acts and we see what God wants to do through the book of Acts, through the life of Jesus, that we begin to start here. And what it's going to do is it's going to invite you and beckon from you a question. If you follow the way of Jesus and therefore have the Holy Spirit, does my life look like this? It's going to ask this of you. As a church, as a church that is gathered today around the person and work of Jesus Christ, played out in our church and in our lives by the power of the Holy Spirit. Does my life, does a spirit-filled life, does my life look like this? So let's start in Acts 3. Verse 1 and 2, this is what it says. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer, at 3 in the afternoon. Now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those 
going into the temple courts. Now, let's set the scene for a minute. You've got to understand that, that the, the disciples, which these are two of the disciples that we call the disciples, now they're the apostles or the ones carrying forward the, the message of Jesus filled with the Holy Spirit. They had a regular rhythm of going to the temple, which the temple was the center of worship. They would have a, a rhythm of going at 9 a.m., 3 p.m., and sunset every day. You oftentimes wonder throughout the Gospels, if you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, and you hear, like, they knew where each other were. Like, you know, they didn't have cell phones. We didn't have telephones. You couldn't call somebody and be like, hey, you guys going to be there? But they knew that their lives were around the rhythm of prayer at 9 a.m., at 3 p.m., and at sunset. And so these guys are regularly going back to the temple, and they have been doing this their life, um, as well as we meet this man who has been, is being carried to the temple called by this gate where he's put every day to beg. So this was his life. We don't know how long he's been begging, but probably a long time. We find out that he's been um, in this state for 40 years. From the time that he was born, he had this injury of some type, and so he couldn't walk, and so he had to be carried to the gate every day. We don't know how long it was. But that, this idea, and he was set down to beg, and we gotta understand that in this context, part of, of Judaism, uh, the piety, the worship of God, is actually a deep care and concern for the poor, the marginalized. I mean, you read through the whole Hebrew scriptures, that he's like, I need you to care for those that are on the margins of society, those that are poor, those that don't have. God was very clear that I want my heart of justice and compassion to be through you to those people. And so a part of their life was probably they're going to worship, they're going to the temple. This guy probably did pretty well. Like it was a moment where the people were in that mindset, they were going to worship, and they would see this guy there every day. Now, how this is worded is he wasn't even set down yet. They, they were still carrying him in. And in this moment, you see this, this appointment setting up. If you've read through the Gospel of Luke, and now you're in Acts, you understand how Luke writes. And you can understand that, that something's happening, that there's a moment at play here, a divine moment that is happening. And the first thing, a spirit-filled life seizes divine appointments. Throughout life, we have opportunities walking with the Holy Spirit, whether or not we will seize the divine moments and appointments that he has for us. And in this moment, we see this. There's this guy, he's being carried in. We see Peter and John, and this collision is going to take place, and he's setting us up. There will always be moments, appointments, divine appointments for us. The question is, do we see them? The question is, do we go, Jesus, I, I see you in that, and I'm about that. You know, I, I have friends of mine um, that I feel like they always have a, a story, a moment, that God showed up, that God did something, that the Holy Spirit was present in a conversation, meeting somebody in the store, somewhere where they're going, somewhere that they stopped and helped somebody get their car started, and then they prayed for healing, and the guy got healed. And You know, you hear these amazing stories. And I think that those things are all accessible to us. I just think that sometimes people just pause and see what God's doing. Instead of just being so busy in their own lives that we would have space, we'd have eyes to see the divine appointments that God has for us. So when this man saw Peter and John, verse 3, uh, about to enter into the temple, he asked them for money. People, people, uh, Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. So in this moment, this man's not even put down at the gate yet. He's walking in, his friends are carrying him, and he looks at them and says, hey, give me something. Right? And they say, hey, I want you to look at us. Now, why would they say this? They want his full attention. They want his full attention because if you're a good beggar, if you're coming by me, I ask you for money. And before you walk by, I ask you for money. And before they walk by, I ask you for money. The more opportunities I ask for people to give me money, better odds are I'm going to receive something from somebody. Does that make sense? So he just goes from them. He goes to the next person. And they said, no, 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 stop. Stop. Look at me. Look at me. I'm, I want you to look at me. So the man gave them his attention, and however the look was, he knew, and he was expecting that they were going to give him something. The spirit-filled life doesn't just seize divine moments, but the spirit-filled life demonstrates compassion. I think they saw in Peter and John 
They saw something in his eyes. You've got to understand that throughout the book of Acts, it's the life of Christ being lived out through the apostles and the people that follow Jesus. And in, in reality, what we see here is, is something Jesus would have done. You read the Gospels, you go, that's exactly what Jesus would have done. Stop, look, have compassion, reach out, touch. Think about all the stories in the Gospels about Jesus and how he did. And you got to understand that Peter and John were his disciples being trained up by him. And so the very things that you see them do are because they're like, oh, note to self. That's important. We saw Jesus do that. This is how I live. I want to live like Christ. And in this moment, we see that they demonstrate compassion. And something's going to happen here. In verse 6, then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have. And at that point, the dude's like, this was not a good idea. Right? The guy wants resource. He wants money. He needs money. That's how, it's what he does. We don't know how long, but we know that he regularly begged at the gate beautiful. And so he wanted money. And as soon as they said, silver and gold I do not have, he was like, next. <laughs> right? Because that's what he wanted. But he didn't know what he really needed. He knew what he wanted. He didn't know what he really needed. But what I do have, I give you, Peter says. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Now before I talk about in the name of Jesus and what that means, I'm going to go back. Silver and gold I do not have. Oftentimes... As Christ followers, we stop there. We become inactive in the way of Jesus and in the kingdom because what we do not have, not what we do have. And so often, I have defaulted to go like, well, I don't have that, so I can't do that. I don't have the right knowledge. How can I leave a discipleship community? I don't know about that. How can I lead a cohort? I don't. I don't know enough Bible knowledge. How am I supposed to disciple somebody? I don't know how to do that. How am I supposed to step into that situation and care for somebody that looks different than me, thinks differently than me? I don't, I don't have enough knowledge. I don't have enough you name it. And it causes the church to be inactive because of what we don't have. And what I love here is they were active not based on what they didn't have, but based on what they did have. And what would it look like for a church to believe that we have everything, the Bible says, for life and godliness, that we have the opportunity to live the life of Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit and to be an active, to be an active place. So in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Peter says, walk, walk. So in the name, in the name. In the name means everything that Jesus is now and forever. And in context speaks especially to his authority in his power to be demonstrated for his glory. Uh, you know this. A name is an expression of a person's very essence. It's, it, it's like when you say Jesus, it's all the things. In the name of Jesus, it's who they are, the very essence of who he is. The name of Jesus is a direct link between heaven and earth. We got to understand it's not a magical formula that if I just say in the name of Jesus, whatever I want to happen happens. It's not a magic, magic formula, but a simple recognition, a simple recognition that if any good gifts are given, anything, they must arrive in and through the person of Jesus Christ. I mean, everything that we do should be in the name of Jesus. Every text. Every email, every conversation, every parenting moment, every friendship, everything, every business dealing, everything that we do as Jesus followers filled with the, with the Holy Spirit should be in the name of Jesus. Now, Henry Nouwen, he says this. I think it's a great, great, great quote. It says, ministry is acting in the name of Jesus. When all our actions are in the name, they will bear fruit for eternal life. To act in the name of Jesus, however, doesn't mean to act as a representative of Jesus or his spokesman or spokesperson. It means to act in an intimate communion with him. The name is like a house, a tent, a dwelling. To act in the name of Jesus, therefore, 
means to act from the place where we are united with Jesus in love. To the question, where are you? We should be able to answer, I am in the name. Then, whatever we do cannot be other than ministry because it will always be Jesus himself who acts in and through us. The final question for all who minister is, are you in the name of Jesus? When we can say yes to that, all of our lives will be ministry. And if there's one thing that that Mike has said over and over and over from this platform, and as a staff we carry, is that we want it to not be about this. That the Spirit of God unleashed outside of this wall is the way of Jesus. That everything you do in the name of Jesus, whether you build buildings, whether you wipe baby butts, I mean it. Is the name of in the name of Jesus is ministry. Whether you are doing great things that the world thinks is great or simple things that people don't ever see. The idea of the church unleashed and what we see in Acts as the people of God doing the things of Jesus by the power of the Spirit is this sense of it just happens outside, outside of the building. And that was the whole thing, the battle of the temples. Temple was the center of worship, yet we got to understand that when Jesus went to the cross, that the, the curtain was torn in half, that a new relationship with Jesus was about, and that the Spirit of God was poured out now on all. And so the movement of Jesus through the power of the Spirit was outside of the building. A building not made by hands and stones that meant the center of worship, but a building made of human hearts and people that follow the way of Jesus. That's what we want to be about. And anything you do in the name of Jesus is ministry. I mean, I hope that frees you. I hope that frees you. That the very thing that you are doing, wherever you are doing it in the name of Jesus, very well could be more important than what I'm doing right now. It's as important and very well could be more important as what is happening right now. Because the Spirit of God wants to meet people. The kingdom of God wants to be unleashed outside of the walls. The Spirit-filled life displays God's power. It displays God's power, verse 7, taking him by the right hand, which is the hand of blessing. He helps him up. And instantly, the man's feet and ankles become strong. Forty years he's been like this from birth. And instantly in this moment, his feet become strong. He jumped to his feet. I mean, you would too, right? You would jump to your feet and begin to walk. Could you imagine this moment, the excitement? Man, people are walking by this guy. Do you understand that Jesus probably walked by this guy? This is just months ago that all this happened with Jesus ascending and crucifixion and temple. We don't know how long he was there, but there's a good chance, because this was through the gates on the south, southern side of the temple, probably is what they think, that, that these, this is where everybody, all the pilgrims came, and they would walk past this guy. And my guess is the disciples and Jesus have walked past that man. But in this moment, there was a divine appointment for this guy. And when he was healed, he, then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. What's interesting is we see this uh, in Isaiah 35. This, this idea of walking and jumping and leaping um, would, would make you remember if you were someone that understood the, the Hebrew scriptures like the, like the people that heard this and it was written to, you would think of Isaiah 35. Isaiah 35 is this idea about this future hope that comes and the idea of that the, the blind will see, the, the deaf will hear, that people will, like their legs will become strengthened and they will leap like deers. They will jump around in joy of the Lord. And the reason why we think that is is because when John the Baptist, who got put in prison and was going to lose his head and be killed before he went to death, said to Jesus, Jesus, are you sure you're the guy? I mean, I've given my life to you. I've given my life, everything, and I'm going to die for it. What do I say? And in that moment, Jesus says, tell John the Baptist, Isaiah 35. That's what he tells him. What does he say? Jesus says that the blind will see, 
the devil here. What he's doing, he's saying, hey, remember Isaiah 35? I've started that. It's not in full completion yet, but I've started it, John. So when you go and you die for me, I want you to know I'm that guy. This is what Isaiah 35 says. I don't have it up here. I'm just going to read it to you. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. And Jesus began to fulfill this. To fulfill this. And when all the people saw him walking, verse 9, and praising God, walking and praising God, worshiping, like literally, God, you are worthy. I'm, I'm, I'm walking and praising God. They recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. I mean, isn't that the hope? Isn't the hope that when the church is living like Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit, that people are filled with wonder and amazement. Let me ask you a question. When was the last time that you were filled with wonder and amazement at the things of God? I had to ask myself that question. As I'm walking through preparing for this message, I'm like, yeah, when, when, is, when was the last time that I was filled with wonder and amazement at the things of of Jesus. And I had to stop. And it didn't take me long, but I had to stop and I had to recollect, you know what? Yeah, I have been in wonder and amazement. And there's things just this last couple weeks that causes me wonder and amazement, but I have to identify it. So, so often we just keep going and go through the motions and we forget what it means to just be filled with wonder and amazement. Now, when it comes to this story of this man being miraculously healed. It does beg the question, like I said, we're looking in the scripture and letting the scriptures come to life. It does beg the question, does God heal today? That's a long time ago. Pentecost, pour out of the spirit. Jesus, not too many months after Jesus was ascended. But does God heal today? At Grace Chapel, we believe that God heals today. We believe that. Do we always see it? No. But we believe it, and oftentimes in the church, not just th not this church specifically, but in the church at bigger, this, the pendulum kind of swings when it comes to healing in the church. Number one is, I don't see it, therefore I don't believe it. Like, I don't see it. I might have prayed for healing, I might be praying for healing, and I've never seen it, therefore I don't believe it. I don't think God does. I don't think God does. And the other side is, God heals everything, everyone, always, and if he doesn't, then it's on you. It's your faith or the prayer's faith. And that's wrong as well. Both of those are extremes that are wrong. We don't understand why God chooses to heal in moments and doesn't in other moments. But you cannot read through the scriptures without seeing that God, for some reason, says that if we're supposed to experience Jesus in his fullness, in his resurrected life, which sometimes means that there is healing supernaturally that happens, it happens all over the world, documented, real, and that we would rejoice in his sufferings, which means that we don't always find healing. And I want to kind of jump into a theology for a minute with you because I think it really helps us process these things. It doesn't solve it, but it helps us process. And it's this idea of the already but not yet kingdom. We have to understand the already but not yet kingdom. And so I've crafted some, some things here because I really want to I I walk through them with you. The concept of the already but not yet kingdom refers to the tension between the present reality of God's kingdom already started by Jesus. Like the kingdom of God is here already we see Moments of the miraculous, signs and wonders, amazing things happening all over the world. And its future completion when Jesus returns. But yet it's not completely fulfilled yet. So let's talk about already started. Jesus already started the kingdom. With the life, death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus, the kingdom of God was already started on earth. It's already started. That's why he says to you, Pray on earth as it is in heaven. 
Like we will see heaven breaking into our here and now. This means that through Jesus, God's rule and reign have already begun to to be established in the hearts of believers and in the world. The effects of this are seen in the transformation of lives, miracles, signs and wonders, acts of justice and compassion, and the spread of the gospel. I hope you know that the kingdom of God is on the move. Do you guys know that? Do you know that the church is growing faster than it ever has in the history of the world? You probably don't know that because you sit in America. Around the world, the church is growing faster than it has ever grown. The number one denomination that is growing faster than any other denomination is Pentecostal. They're saying that that the majority of Christians in the world will be in sub-Sahara Africa in very short time. The church of God is exploding. And I don't know what you hear and what you think, but the church of God is exploding around the world. Jesus is being elevated. God is on the move. The kingdom cannot be stopped. Amen? It's true. That's true. But yet it's not fulfilled. Completion is not here. While the kingdom of God is indeed present and active now, it has not yet been brought to completion. The fullness of the kingdom, including the complete destruction of sin, death, and suffering, and the restoration of all creation, awaits the return of Jesus. The future aspect of the kingdom promises a world fully under God's righteous and loving rule, and we are not there yet. There is still sin. There is still brokenness. So living in the tension. How do we live in the tension? You and I, if we're Jesus followers, are called to live in the tension of the already but not yet kingdom. This means actively participating in the kingdom work started by Jesus, spreading the gospel, seeking justice and compassion, loving the marginalized, signs and wonders, the miraculous, while also longing for and looking forward to the complete realization of the kingdom when Jesus returns. Understanding this, guys, this is so important. Understanding this helps us navigate the complexities of living in a world where God's kingdom is present and growing, but yet not fully realized. It encourages an active faith towards the kingdom goals in the present while keeping hope alive for the future completion of God's redemptive plan. The already, but not yet. It allows us to live in that tension and go, God, I, I'm going to trust you. I don't know, but I'm going to trust you. And we are not going to stop praying for the kingdom things of Jesus on this earth just because maybe we haven't seen it. No, we believe that the kingdom of God has been unleashed and we're about it. And yet, God, someday we know that you will return and all things will come under your rule. And there will be no more sin and sickness and brokenness and sin. When verse 11, this man is holding on to Peter and John, right? He's in the temple courts. He's holding on. He's experienced all this that we've talked about. And all the people were astonished and came running to them in the place called Solomon's Colony. This is what happens when the power of God is on display. Astonished and came running. This is what happens when the power of God, not the power of man or woman, or really fancy speaker, or really, really good worship leader, but when the power of God is on display, people are astonished and they come running. What now? What now? Well, the Spirit-filled life boldly proclaims the gospel, the good news. You see this in the life of Jesus. He would heal somebody, someone would get healed, and then who was on the scene really quick? Pharisees, religious rulers, hey man, come and at him. He would have a conversation about theology or a conversation about the life of the spirit, you know, whatever the kingdom life, whatever it might be. There'd be opposition, but he would boldly proclaim the gospel. And look what happens here. When Peter saw this, as they were coming, what now? Peter saw this. He said to them, fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us? As if by our own power or godliness, we made this man walk. Like, of course it wasn't on us. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant, 
Jesus, when they heard that word, servant Jesus, these people in the context of the temple complex would think of one main place, Isaiah 53, the suffering servant, which says that this servant Jesus is the Messiah. This is the one that you've been asking to come year after year after year. This is him, and he's not dead. He's alive, and he's on the move. You handed him over to be killed, and you disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. You disowned the holy and righteous one and asked that a murderer be released to you. You killed the originator, the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this. Chapter 2, you will be my witnesses in Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. We are witnesses of this. Acts 3.16, by faith in the name of Jesus, declare the good news of Jesus. This man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him as you can all see. Now, it's important to stop here for a minute. When we're talking about the supernatural and healing, and we talk about this thing called faith, where did the faith come from for this healing to happen? This was not a subjective faith. This was not the faith of Peter and John. It was not the faith of the man. This was faith in the name of Jesus, that the faith was enough in the object of Jesus for the healing. Not based on whether Peter and John had the faith or whether the man had the faith, but the faith, it is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him. There is faith in the object of Jesus for the supernatural to happen. And that is where we keep our eyes fixed. That that faith is enough for a supernatural miracle. But that's super important because in this whole idea of healing and breakthrough, it's like, man, you don't have enough faith. You don't have enough faith. You don't have enough faith. Here, it's very clear in Scripture. Search it yourself. Read the Greek if you know it. Like, that the faith is in the name of Jesus alone and not subjective in somebody. All can see. He goes on, 17. Now, fellow Israelites, I know that you acted in ignorance as did your leaders. You think of Jesus saying, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. They're acting in ignorance. But this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that this Messiah would suffer. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord, and that he may send the Messiah who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. Now, the call to everybody at the temple complex is the call to you and me. Repent, return, be refreshed. You know, I've been reminded over the last few weeks of this idea of repentance and this idea of how much people keep sin in a manageable thing in their life. Secret sin, things that are ripping them up from the inside out. And I just want to have a moment of talking truly about the holiness of God and about this idea of repentance. I have a couple friends in the area. There's a worship leader that's a kind of a famous worship leader that just got um, revealed that he was participating in all sorts of stuff. I have friends that have done all the right things. They were leading all the right worship. They were in the scripture regularly. They were saying all the right things. They were doing all the right podcasts. They were standing on stages much like this, and then they blew up their life. And you see it over and over and over. And I think the word is the same, repent and return and find refreshment. It is so hard to hang on to secrets. It is so hard to manage your sin to just say, I got sin, I'm okay, I'm managing it. And could we be a church that decides that we want to be repentant people to say, God, there's this stuff in me, and I need to repent from it, and I need to turn to you, and I believe that I will find refreshment. I think it's time for the church to not just be okay managing our sin, to have secrets I mean, you might be, there might be somebody here that's flirting with an old fling. There might be somebody here that's, that's on dating apps hooking up. There might be someone here that is participating in who knows what. There might be people here that are 
have addictions that nobody knows, that your spouse doesn't know, that your kids don't know, that your closest friends and your cohort and your small group don't know. And I think as a church, we have to deal with that stuff. To repent, to return and believe that God will bring times of refreshing. That actually the way that you flourish is by repenting, is by returning to the Lord and find the flourishing life that only comes through Jesus. So his call is to us the same as it was to them. Repent, return, find refreshment. Scott McKnight, he says this, repentance, according to Peter, is the means by which those on earth may begin to experience times of refreshing. Again, the ascension of the risen Christ means that what Jesus is experiencing in heaven can begin to be experienced now on earth in the present. But this is merely a foretaste, a beginning of the end of time when God will restore all things. So as the story continues into chapter 4, Peter begins to, to talk about all the prophets, Moses and Samuel, and how they spoke of all the things of Jesus, that, you know, this was the Messiah and all these things. And he ended with this idea that the promise of Abraham, do you guys remember that through you, all your offspring will be blessed? He's telling the people at the temple complex, remember, this is what you read in the Hebrew scriptures, all pointing to Jesus. So because of this, talking about resurrection, that Jesus is raised, and that the life of the church and Jesus moving forward, everybody comes around him, they're angry, religious leaders are angry, they get confronted by the leaders of the temple, temple complex because they were proclaiming Jesus and the resurrection. Pick it up in verse 3 of chapter 4. They seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. But many who heard the message believed. So the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. Grew to about 5,000. Now you're going to understand that by this time, they think there's probably about 10,000 people that are following between women, children, and men, about 10,000 people that were following over a few months. At Pentecost, a few thousand were added. Now, there's even more thousands that are added. The God is on the move. They heard it. They believed. So the next day, Peter and John are brought before the top religious leaders. Pick it up in verse 7. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them, by what power or what name did you do this? Now, the spirit-filled life faces opposition with courage and faith, with courage and faith. Now, look what, look what they do. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man, like really, you're gonna get mad at us for doing an act of kindness to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, you ready? It is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Courage, faith, gospel proclamation in the midst of who knows what's gonna happen. When they saw the courage of Peter and John, and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished, and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. But since they could see the man who had been healed standing there with them, there was nothing they could say. Do you realize that everybody gets astonished in this story? I mean, everybody is astonished. I love that word. Like, they're literally going, we don't know what's going on. We are literally astonished. The religious leaders are astonished because they don't understand what's going on. The people that just saw this guy who was the beggar healed are astonished. People are astonished. They're being drawn to Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit. I love this word, that these men had been with Jesus. Now, when we talk about unschooled, ordinary men, we're not saying that they were not smart. They were extremely smart. They knew the Hebrew Scriptures extremely well. What it means is that they didn't belong to any rabbinical school. Like there was a couple of big rabbinical schools that if you wanted to be someone like a rabbi, you would have to go and be trained up underneath them. And they weren't under any rabbinical school. They followed the way of Jesus. 
And so they said they're unschooled, ordinary men because they didn't belong to any rabbinical school, but they had been with Jesus. I mean, do you see that, that, that what Jesus began to do and to teach is just following through the apostles, is just following through the followers of Jesus, that they were with Jesus, that because they were with Jesus, they became like Jesus, and then they did what Jesus did. But it was interesting that they said that these men were with Jesus. When was the last time that you would say, I was with Jesus? Do you have a regular time in your life, in your weekly rhythm, where you would say, I'm with Jesus? Like, I'm with him. And I'm with him because I want intimacy with him to become like him. Like, that's why I'm with Jesus. That I want all the things of Jesus and his name to rub off on me. And so I began to look like Jesus and begin to do what Jesus would do out of my being with him. And that's what we see in the book of Acts. People that had been with Jesus, they became like Jesus, and they did what Jesus would do. This is what we see as the church is unleashed. So to finish the story, they asked them to leave the Sanhedrin. They decided to command them to no longer speak in the name of Jesus, which is interesting. Verse 18, then they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. Like, that's going to work. But Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to him? You be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. I would love for us as Jesus followers to begin to speak about what we have seen and heard. Not about what other people have written. Not about what other people have said. Not about what this person says or that person says or we speak these things or we speak those things. But what would it look like for a church to truly speak the things that they have seen and they have heard? The ways that Jesus has met you in the middle of brokenness and hardship that you would speak out of those things. Learning from others is so important. Books, resources. But what was beautiful here is that we can't stop speaking about what we have seen and we have heard. So they let Peter and John go after threatening them even more. They went right to their community and they shared everything. They went right to their community and shared everything and they started to raise their voices in prayer. Let's pick up at the end of their prayer. Acts 4, verse 29. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. A spirit-filled life expects there will be breakthrough. They knew what Jesus wanted to do. They knew it. They didn't have to wonder or question. Enable your servants. They're saying, we know the threats, we know what's going on, but enable your servants to speak your word with boldness and that we would see you do the miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant Jesus. Words and wonders. And after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. Man, do you expect God to move? We just let the scriptures speak for the last 45 minutes and just allow what it looks like for the people of God filled by the Spirit to be played out. And as we close, we're going we're gonna to have a time of response. If you stand with me. The team's going to come out. And we're going to sing a song in a minute. But I want to lead us in just a, a time of reflection. There's two calls, I believe, that, that, that are in the room today. One is deep repentance. Repenting, being honest with your sin, returning to the Lord, and believing that you will find times of refreshment. So that's the first one. So maybe for you, um, we oftentimes say around here, hands open in front of you, just this way of like saying, Sur I'm surrendered, I'm open, it's an open posture. I think something when we do something in our bodies, oftentimes it helps our minds connect and our hearts connect. But would you just take a moment, would you allow the Spirit of God to reveal the secret sin, the sin 
that you managed or that you have managed or are managing? And would you just repent of it? Just repent of it. Come Holy Spirit. First service, I really heard this very clearly, and I think it's for both services. It's this idea that for some of you, you're thinking through logically how you're going to just pull up your bootstraps and, and um, manage that sin even more. And I really feel for you, the Spirit of God is saying, go, believe, go below that into the very core of who you are and would identify where did this sin have its start, what was going on, that you would say, Jesus, I need you to meet me there. God, I'm once again reminded that it's your kindness that leads us to repentance, like you're beckoning us, like inviting us into flourishing life with Jesus. It's not about shame or some mean, grouchy dad that just wants to hurt. But Lord, this beautiful kindness in the face of Jesus that's just asking us with kindness to repent, to return. I want to give you times of refreshing. second call in the room is that um, we want to we want to expect God for breakthrough and it might be a breakthrough in your body physically emotionally mentally spiritually it might be breakthrough in your career your job it might be breakthrough in whatever it might be but what we're going to do is if you are asking the spirit of God for breakthrough in a number of different ways we're going to ask you to raise your hand and when you raise your hand, what we're going to do is we're going to have people around you that don't have their hand raised join you. Put a hand on your shoulder, a hand on your back, and just pray that the Spirit of God would bring breakthrough in your life. And so I just want to ask, who, who is asking for breakthrough in something this morning? Okay? Keep your hands up high. Um, so everybody now move. When, when people are, um, actually, there's a few of you guys. Come on, some people come up front. Pray for this, these crew down here. So people move out of your rows. Keep your hand up. If you have people around you, um, then drop your hand so we know people are, people are covered. So um, let's grab a bunch of people. Come on, y'all. Let's go, church. This is about Unleashed Church. Let's go. Come on up. Come on up. There's a bunch of guys down here. Um, let's surround them. Multiple people can surround these guys. If people, are, if people have a hand on you that are praying for you, you can drop your hand. Or you can keep your hand up. It's up to you. We want to make sure that everybody's covered. Anybody doesn't have people around them? I think you had your hand up, didn't you? Yeah, and let's just pray. The Spirit of God does, does the work, okay? But the Spirit of God does the work. It's not about anything other than we're praying in the name of Jesus. And this is church. This is church. So, Spirit of God, we thank you for what you're doing in the room. 
God, we know it's not about the right words. It's not about some magical formula. God, it truly is Jesus asking you, Holy Spirit, would you enable your spirit to work in and through these people and there'd be breakthrough. Spirit of God, we thank you that this is all in your name. In the name of Jesus Christ. God, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for